Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to the Pastor Study. Let's go back in time 2,000 years. The year is about 30 AD. Jesus is about 30 years old. His cousin, John the Baptist, is six months older than he is. John the Baptist sees Jesus walking down the street and he points at him and says to his men, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Next day, same thing happens. Behold the Lamb of God. Now, John was a prophet, and I'm guessing on this, but I'm guessing John did not know what he meant when he said those words because Jesus wouldn't die until three years later. And I, Sometimes the prophets would say things. That I don't think even they knew what they were prophesying. What I want us to do, the, the reason you and I know what that means is because we have the whole New Testament now. But what I want to do for this program is to go phrase by phrase through that famous line, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This comes from John chapter 1. Let's pray first. <clears throat> Lord, we do want to pray that everyone watching this program will come to trust in Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God and that they will let you, Lord Jesus, take away their sins. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. First word John the Baptist said was, behold. Do you know what the word behold means? It means look at, see. And John the Baptist wants you to see the Lamb of God, because if you don't see the Lamb of God, he doesn't take away your sin. There was an atheist soap manufacturer walking down the street with his Christian friend. The atheist says to the Christian, I don't think your religion works. Christian says, well, why not? Well, your Savior came 2,000 years ago, and look how sinful and messed up the world still is. Your religion doesn't work. Well, they keep walking, and they see a little boy playing over in the dust, and the Christian says to the, the man, well, I don't think your soap works. Of course my soap works. We have a wonderful product. Well, do you see how dirty that little boy is? Your soap doesn't work. And the man says, well, of course my soap works. You have to apply it. And the Christian said, bingo, Jesus works fine, but you need to apply him to your life. John the Baptist says, look at, behold, see the Lamb of God. He works fine for anyone that will do that. But if you don't look at him, it doesn't work. <laughs> Next words, behold the Lamb of God. I remember a confirmation student one day, Pastor Brock, are there sheep up in heaven? I said, I don't think so. Where are you getting that? Well, I've been reading the book of Revelation. They got a lamb up there. <laughs> and he was taking very, very literally the passages where Jesus is the lamb on the throne. <clears throat> what do we mean when we say Jesus is the Lamb of God? To answer that, we have to go to the Old Testament. Three times, lambs show up, and that'll give us the clue on what it means that Jesus is the lamb. The first place a lamb shows up in the Bible is Genesis chapter 22. This is 2000 BC, you probably know the story. Abraham is taking his son Isaac on the top of the hill to sacrifice him like God has told him to do. And Isaac says, Father, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Well, God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. And when God sees that Abraham will kill his son in obedience, the angel says, stop, Abraham, and there's a ram over in the thicket. And they killed the lamb, or the ram, and Isaac went free. <clears throat> Second time you see lambs in the Bible, when an Old Testament Jew committed a sin, he would take a lamb to the temple. It's called the guilt offering, a spotless, unblemished lamb. And he would confess his sins to the priest. The lamb would be killed, but the worshiper was forgiven. 
And then the third time we find lamb in the Old Testament, about 1300 B.C., Moses is trying to get the Jews out of Egypt into the Promised Land. God hits Pharaoh with the plagues, the last plague. Pharaoh, we're going to kill your firstborn sons of Egypt if you don't let my people go. And God says, Moses, have all the Jews take a lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doors of your house. And when the angel of death comes over Egypt tonight, if the angel sees the blood on the doorpost, it'll pass over your house. Next morning, all the Jew Egyptian firstborn sons are dead. All the Jewish firstborn sons are saved. To this day, Jews celebrate what's called the Passover, the night that the angel of death passed over their houses. Why? Because of the blood of the lamb. So what does it mean when Jesus is the blood of the lamb, the, 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 the lamb of, of God? Well, here's the hint. Instead of Isaac getting killed, the, the ram got killed. Instead of the Old Testament worshiper getting killed, the lamb got killed. Instead of the Israelite firstborns getting killed, the lamb got killed. So when we say Jesus is the lamb of God, we mean something called the substitutionary atonement. The lamb points to the fact that I'm a sinner, I deserve God's wrath, Jesus comes down, slips in between God and I. God puts his wrath or his anger or punishment for my sin on Jesus so that I'm forgiven. There was a fire that went through a farmyard, burnt the barns and the house and the animals. A fireman afterwards is going through, and here is a black charred hen, like a big piece of charcoal. charcoal. And the fireman goes over and with his foot tips the hen over, and out from under this charcoal hen scatters five chickadees alive. <laughs> and the mother hen had taken the fire herself, but it saved her chickadees. When we say Jesus is the Lamb of God, we mean he takes the wrath of God. He pays for our sins on the cross, so we won't have to. In Europe, there is a tall, ancient cathedral Hundreds of years ago, when they were building that cathedral, one of the workmen fell off the roof down, everybody assumed, to his death because it's a tall cathedral. When people scurried down and checked, the workman was dazed, but he was fine. Because what happened, a shepherd boy had been driving his flock of sheep before him to market. They happened to be right under the cathedral when the man fell. The man crushed to death one of the lambs but he himself got up and was fine. And according to the story, instead of putting a cross on the top of that cathedral, they put a statue of the Lamb. <laughs> when we say Jesus is the Lamb of God, we mean he was crushed. He took our punishment for us so we can be forgiven and saved. Behold, look at the Lamb of God. He's our substitute. Next words. Who takes away the sin of the world. Now, let's, let's look at the word takes away for a minute. Does he do that? I mean, I've been a Christian many years. I still sin in thought, word, and deed daily. So what does it mean that he takes away my sin? Well, he won't totally take away your sin till you're in heaven. Then you'll be perfect. But these words have to mean something because it's not future tense. He will take away your sin. It's present tense. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who present tense takes away our sin. So what does it mean? Well, there are two ways Jesus presently takes away our sin. Number one, he takes away the guilt of our sin. So after church one day, a woman comes up crying. She's kneeling at the altar, and I go up, and is something wrong? And Pastor Brock, years ago, I had an abortion, and I can't believe God will forgive me for that. So I knelt next to her. I told her about the Lamb of God. Yes, it's right. You do deserve to go to hell. So do I. But when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for your sin of abortion. And she confessed her sin. I put my hand on her head. I announced to her the forgiveness of her sins through the blood. That means through the saving death of Christ. The only way I can sleep at night is knowing I have the Lamb of God who takes away the guilt of my sin. Back in 1898 in Chicago, they had something called the Parliament of World Religions. And on stage, they had a Muslim, a Hindu, a Buddhist, and a Christian. 
In front of this large crowd, each person got up and explained their religion. The last person to stand up was the Christian, and he, instead of explaining Christianity, he tells Shakespeare's story of Lady Macbeth how she kills at the beginning of the play, and the rest of the play she's washing her hands, saying, out damaged spot, because she thinks she's got a blood stain on her, on her hand. Well, the, um, the uh, man turns to the other people on the dais, and he says, gentlemen, which of your religions can get the spot out of Lady Macbeth's hand? There's only one. And you remember what Pilate did after he said you can kill Jesus? He starts washing his hands. A lot of people use alcohol. A lot of people use drugs. A lot of people use sex. They're trying to drown out the guilt. There's only one place you can go to get the present tense guilt taken away, and that's the Lamb of God. So Jesus takes away the, the guilt of our sin presently. The second thing he does to take away our sin he takes away the frequency of our sin. I mean, uh, there's an old saying, I'm not what I should be, I'm not what I will be, but thank God, I'm not what I was. <laughs> and I, I saw a Christian lady, uh, I haven't seen her for a couple of years, I run, ran into her at a garage sale, and she says to me, oh, Pastor Brock, you know, my husband's an unbeliever, and sometimes I cuss. And he says to me, oh, the way you swear, and you're a Christian? And, you know, what, I don't know what to say to him, she said. I said, well, first of all, don't cuss. But then I said, you can say this to your husband. You think I cuss now? You should see what I'd be like if I didn't have Jesus in my life. <laughs> so um, uh, he takes away the frequency of our sin. Let me tell you a mistake I made this week. If you go to pastorstudy.org, two S's, I write Facebook articles, and you, anybody can, can see them there about heresy in the church and current events. Well, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the big liberal branch of Lutheranism, recently came out with a worship service for same-sex couples. In that horrible, first of all, what are they doing that for, to begin with? But in that horrible liturgy, they refer to God as our mother, and our lover. So I wrote an article against that, meaning to send it to my Facebook at pastorstudy.org. I pushed the wrong button, and I sent it to a, a number of very liberal pastors in the ELCA. Boy, did I get barbecued. But I will tell you, the minute I sent it to the wrong address, I thought to myself, that's the providence of God. I was supposed to do that. And one pastor called me a bald-headed homophobe, an idiot, and a puritanical piece of trash. This is a pastor talking. Well, then I did a little more investigating. The, the, the official that put that horrible liturgy together for gay marriage, he himself is a pastor in the ELCA. He's the head of the worship of the ELCA nationally, and he's got a male um, uh, husband. So I wrote an article on that, and this time I kind of, well, I cared, but not as much. And I pushed it, and I sent it to all the liberals. Man, did I get barbecued. But get, get this. A woman ELCA pastor who was very upset with me for doing that said, because I struggle with same-sex attraction. If you go to my website, you'll see my story on struggling with same-sex attraction. But I say no to it for the sake of my soul. She wrote to everybody, for everybody to see, Pastor Brock, I hope you find a man and enter into the holiness of a same-sex relationship. You know, I, I know the ELCA is liberal. I guess I never thought I would live to see the day where a Lutheran pastor tells me to have gay sex and calls it holy. And you know what the problem is? Some of these liberal Lutheran pastors are into grace abuse. Because we're saved by grace, you don't have to change a thing. That's not what John the Baptist said. Behold the Lamb of God who present tense takes away the sin of the world. You won't be perfect, but he takes away the frequency of it, and you don't live in it. Next words. Behold the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away, last words, the sin of the world. Now notice doesn't say he takes away the sins just of Christians. He takes away the sins of the world. Well, does that mean everybody in the world then will go to heaven? 
Well, no, because you remember the beginning of our sermon. The soap only works if you use it. So if you come to the Lord, Lord Jesus, wash me of my sin, forgive me, he takes away the sins of the world. But if you don't come to him, he doesn't take away your sin. But it says the, the phrase, the sins of the world. I think that means no matter what horrible, evil thing you have done, if you will come to Christ, he will forgive you. I, I had a lady in, in my church, and Pastor Brock, I don't think it's fair that a murderer, that God would let a murderer into heaven. And, you know, I tried to explain it to her, but she didn't get it. We're all murderers. We're all adulterers in our heart. You know, in thought, word, and deed, we all deserve hell. And, and there, it, he takes away the sins of the world, the most horrible, wicked things you can think of. If you'll come to Christ, he can forgive you through his blood. And, and I'll just close with this. There was an older man in our church by the name of Olaf. We called him Saint Olaf. was a wonderful man. And he became a Christian later in life. And you know what he told me? The one thing I got when I came to Christ is peace of mind. If you're watching this show and you're afraid God won't forgive your sins, you're haunted by some awful thing you did, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor's study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of scripture and his insight to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, you said that people have difficulty believing that God has forgiven them for a certain sin. How do they know then that they've been forgiven? Yeah, you know, Jackie, I, I used to be in my earlier Christian days into a trap. If I'd commit a sin, I'd say, God, please forgive me. Amen. And if I still felt guilty, I'd ask, oh, please, God, forgive me. I'd say, I'd say, please forgive me five or six times for the same sin. And somebody pointed out, you need to stop doing that. First, you need to start claiming 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this person said, when you sin, you confess it once, and then you claim the promise, 1 John 1, 9, that you're forgiven, and then you move on. You don't ask five or six times. He forgave you the first time. So claiming the promises of Scripture, sometimes it does help, though, to go to a Christian friend or a pastor or a priest and talk to them about your sin so they can announce to you the forgiveness of sins. Sometimes that's a huge help. Okay, but what happens to the person who, will God forgive someone if they just keep repeating that sin? Yeah. Well, Jackie, when somebody asked me, will God, keep, will God keep forgiving me if I do the same sin over and over? And my response, I hope so. <laughs> Hasn't every Christian committed a certain sin more than once? I think we all have. So, so I think, and remember what Jesus said, uh, Peter says, Jesus, how often do I have to forgive this guy? Seven times a day? And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. Well, if I have to forgive you 490 times a day, God's doing at least that much for me up in heaven. So I think any time you truly come to the Lord for forgiveness, you get it. But if you're living in sin, and I'm doing this, and don't tell me this is wrong, and if you're living in the sin with no repentance, those are the people that the Bible says aren't going to heaven. You know, Tom, it seems like the longer a person is a Christian, the more they see themselves as more sinful. Yeah. And... Aren't Christians supposed to get better? I think both are true. I, I am getting better, Jackie. I'm doing things for the Lord I never would have done when I was young. On the other hand, the longer you're a Christian, I think the more the Lord shows you how sinful you are. They say the greatest saints saw themselves to be the greatest sinners. And the more I live the Christian life, I think, the more I see with the Holy Spirit's help, how Tom Brock needs Jesus Christ, and I will not be saved without Jesus Christ because I'm so sinful. I think both are true. <laughs> okay. Can you explain what is the Agnes Day? The Agnes Day is Latin for Lamb of God. So if you go to a, a lot of Lutheran, Episcopalian, Catholic churches, uh, they'll sing, O oh Christ, the Lamb of God, who take us away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. What we're singing is what John the Baptist told his men in John chapter 1 that we just preached on. 
That's okay. the that's the Agnus Dei. Yeah. Okay, so it's actually like a hymn of that. Yeah, it's a hymn uh, okay. of the scriptures. Yep. Are there any verses that you recommend to help people believe that God has forgiven them? Uh, the ones I like. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess, God forgives. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. A third one would be the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So, and, and Psalm 51, David committed murder and adultery. And if I've sinned, sometimes I like to get on my knees and out loud read Psalm 51 as my confession. And I encourage people to do that. Read Psalm 51 and, and maybe get on your knees and pray to the Lord. There's where God forgave David's adultery and murder. Okay, Pastor Brack, this is a question from one of our viewers about some Christians believe the Jewish temple will be rebuilt and lamb sacrifices will be reestablished. Does the Bible actually teach this? Well, I, I think uh, if you take, is it Second Thessalonians chapter 2 or First Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about the Antichrist coming and he will take his seat in the temple and proclaim himself to be God. Some Christians interpret that to mean literally the Jewish temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And when you see the Muslim Dome of the Rock being blown up, and because that's the only, the Dome of the Rock is built where the Jewish temple used to be. That's the only place the Jewish temple can be rebuilt. And if I, if I see an earthquake take that Dome of the Rock down, I'm going to start taking things literally. On the other hand, it could be symbolic that, that the Antichrist will proclaim himself as God. So I think it's very possible the Jewish temple may be rebuilt. I don't know why we would have lamb sacrifices again, though, in the temple. Because the whole book of Hebrews is about, we don't need lamb sacrifices anymore. Jesus is the new lamb sacrifice. So I would be questioning the second part of that. Okay. So, if Jesus takes away the sin of the world and he died for all, then all won't be saved? No. I mean, the... He who believes in the Lord Jesus will be saved. He who believeth not shall be condemned. So even though he pays for the sins of the world, only those who trust him receive the benefit of that. Yeah. Okay. If people have never heard about Jesus, mm -hmm. though, won't God just judge them on what their life has been like? You, you know, I, I mean, and we're responsible for people we are. not hearing yes. about Jesus Christ. We are. That's right. But you know what people say? Well, you know, if you don't hear about Jesus, God will just judge you by how you lived your life. And I say, okay, then that's trouble, isn't it? Nobody has lived their life so as to be saved. We've all lived our lives and we've sinned in thought, word, and deed. So, okay, let's say God does judge you. If you don't hear about Jesus, he judges you just by the way you lived your life. Well, you're in trouble which is why we need to get Christ to these people because everybody's in trouble. So no, God does not save unbelievers or people that have never heard by how good they've been because nobody's been good. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, uh, let's see, how much time have we got? If you read Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3. In Romans chapter 1, Paul damns all the Gentiles because they knew there was a God and they worshiped idols. In Romans chapter 2, there's Jews in that audience, uh, Christian audience too, Christian Jews in Rome. They're th maybe thinking, go get them, Paul. Get those awful Gentiles. Paul turns the guns on the Jews and says, you had the Ten Commandments and you broke them. You're in trouble. So the, all the d Gentiles are damned, all the Jews are damned. And in chapter 3, Paul brings in Jesus to save them all. But you cannot be saved in chapter 1 or 2 of, 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 of Romans. You've got to wait till chapter 3 comes. That's where our salvation is. So, if people never hear about Jesus, God w won't just judge them based on what they've done then? Well, I, I think he will. He and will. the judgment will be? But it should be on us for not well, taking and, the gospel And I think, to uh, Jackie, American Christianity, where Christians don't tithe, they don't send money to missions, they, uh, they live like everybody else, they're in the, the, I, I think we are accountable, Jackie, for those souls. Pastor Brock, we have a letter from one of our viewers that I'd like to share with you. Um, she writes, thank you for your uh, letter. I think you I responded yep. She's to an her. older woman. Yep. Yes. It was so right and just as it w is in the Bible. I believe in all the facts you wrote about, and I appreciate knowing how much you love the Lord. 
and she says, God bless you on all your programs. It means so much to me and my friend. We turn you on every Sunday and we talk on the phone later and discuss the topic and it's so nice to share with each other. We have your program for our church because we um, can't have a disability and can't always make it with our legs and can't get places we need to be anymore. So we really are so happy because you're so truthful and good. Thank you and God bless you from one of our viewers. Yeah, and, and I just wanted you all to hear that because I get so many wonderful letters, emails from people, especially some older people that can't get to church anymore and we're kind of their church. So I want to thank you all that watch this show and give because you're helping us get the gospel into these homes. And if you go to pastorstudy.org, two S's, you can go there and you can watch all of our TV shows anytime you want for free. And so recommend us if you would. And if the Lord nudges you to pray for us, we, we covet your prayers. And if the Lord nudges you to give a gift to keep us on the air and reach more cities, then uh, the, the money you send in goes to pay for airtime overwhelmingly. So if the Lord nudges you to help us expand, you'll see the address in a minute on the screen, or you can go to pastorstudy.org and, and do it there too. Okay, as long as you're talking about that, um, where, what channels are we on now, yeah. or where, Yeah, I guess? we are on nationally on what's called Christian Television Network on Dish TV and Di Direct TV and Dish Network. But we're on in a bunch of other cities too. So go to pastorstudy.org, look on the left-hand column. That'll tell us where our TV show is, is on in your city so, so you can see it. Yeah. We want to thank you for being with us this week. We pray that God will be with you, granting you his richest blessings until we're all together again next time. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always.